Hello and welcome to My Life in 10 Pictures, where we take a peek into the personal photo albums of some of Scotland's best-known personalities. My guest today is a Dundee-born musician, singer, songwriter and broadcaster. As well as extensive solo work, he's also frontman of one of the most successful Scottish rock bands of all time. We are talking Deacon Blue. So, it's a real pleasure to welcome Ricky Ross to My Life in 10 Pictures. Ricky, welcome along. Thank you, Angus. One of the most distinctive voices in Scotland and a rather famous face as well. So let's have a look, first of all, at how that face looked way back in the past. Tell us Gosh. about this first picture we have today. Um, well, th this, is, um, this is me and uh, my father and mother in, I think, the house that I grew up in, my sister in the middle. Um, we didn't have a lot of... <laughs> we didn't do a lot of family uh, photographs. Uh, there was an official one like this. I think the official one I ended up getting... Um, my nose bashed uh, if someone comes <laughs> through a door. So this might be a slightly happier one. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, my father, my father didn't like. My father never liked getting photographs mm -hmm. uh, taken. So he very really, he, he very really smiled on them. But this is quite a really kind of just happy one. And my sister's yeah about two three years older than me. So so you 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 grew up in Dundee. Do you yeah. have do you have an earliest memory or of of growing up? You know, one of the earliest memories I have is full of that house and there was a guy along the road from me and myself and I don't know how we heard it, we didn't have a record player at the time, but we, we loved the Beatles. So this is like the early 60s and we, sat, we stood on the porch with tennis rackets and sang Beatles songs and that's, mm -hmm. that's one of my earliest sort of musical memories and, and memories of that particular happy house. So it's fair to say music has been with you literally throughout your life? Yeah, I mean... I, Music was a big part because my mum played piano and there was piano in the house and my sister played piano and played violin and my dad loved music but it, we, as I say we didn't have a record player till mm -hmm. a few years after this but I think he had a you know he always loved the car radio and radio was a big thing so I, I think it sort of filtered in there somehow. Right this uh, moving to the next picture you're still fairly young uh, in, in this one um, explain this one to us. You know this this photograph was is not one that I grew up with. We, we didn't have a camera, and <laughs> or, or my mum did. In fairness, though, she did take photographs, but my dad didn't take photographs, and we didn't weren't big, you know, like movie people, you know, cine camera people. So I think someone, a friend of the family, sent this photograph to my mother a few years ago, and I was so pleased to see it because mm -hmm. I didn't have that many photographs. This is me with my grandfather, my, my on my maternal side, Joe Ford, and he was a, he's a great great character. Went through the First World War. Um, you know, raised four children. Um, life changed a lot for them. They, you know, you did different jobs and so on. But basically, when I was young, when I was at this age, I was in their house a lot. They lived in the Hawk Hill in Dundee, uh, which is, uh, you know, towards the... Just, you know, you can walk into the centre of town from there. Mm. And just really happy memories of, of their tenement flat where, where, where they, they were sort of retired at that point and they were coming over to ours. And I just have enormously uh, happy memories of him. He, he was like my big friend, you know. <laughs> Important people to you then, your grandparents. Not many people are that fortunate. No, I mean, that's right. My kids only have one grandparent. Um, mm. he, since the time they were born, there's only been one grandparent alive, really, for, for most of the time. Uh, so it was, a, it was a big thing for us. My, these particular grandparents had only two grandchildren in Dundee. The rest had sort of fled the nest, and yeah. two, you know, one set of cousins, two sets of cousins were in Africa. One was in Wales. Um, my paternal grandfather died quite young as well. So, you know, just to have this couple were just enormous. And my cousin would come up from Wales, and he and I, between us, would, would adopt my grandfather as our friend. He'd come <laughs> to all our games. So he was just a big, you know, a big, big character for me. And obviously, you know, you were important to them as well. Let's move on to this next picture. You're grown up now. You, you've clearly left school. Very serious young man Yes. in this picture. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this. My, my friend David Heaven, I should give the credit, sent me this photograph. <clears throat> Again, I didn't have any photographs, but he sent it and put it up on Facebook uh, a couple of years ago, so I thought I would steal it from him. Um, <laughs> it's actually in his, his house. We all had a band at the time. Uh, that I was at college. I think it was in the uh, maybe the last year at college studying and I think during a holiday we all went to his parents' house in Creef where they weren't there and we set up a little studio and we did a first sort of you know recording kind of session for yeah. ourselves. Um, so it was it was kind of what you do. Um, I knew really nothing about 
recording or anything like that, but it was just my first sort of foray into, into that world. Just, just to, to, to backtrack ever so slightly, you said you were at college, you mm. studied teaching, yeah. you did actually teach yeah. for a while. Was that a, 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 a stopgap or what happened about I, the teaching? I, I, I like teaching. Um, I, I did it essentially, I qualified and I didn't want to do it. Um, and I worked in a youth project where I, for about two to two and a half years or, or thereabouts. And I learned so much in that short time. But eventually I wanted to get a job where I, I'd, I'd earn some money and be able to do, you know, I had no life on my own and the youth project was all consuming. So I wanted to do something that really stopped, you know, at, at, at dinner time and, and you can do something else. So teaching was a way, it allowed me to do something else in the evening and still, you know, you know keep a roof over my head. So I know your mum was a teacher, so yeah. how did she feel about this veering off from the chosen career? Um, well, it's t <laughs> the trouble is now, I guess it's too long ago to remember. I think, <laughs> but I still think I'm probably one of a generation of people involved in the arts whose parents still really don't know what they do, you know. Um, and it, we've managed to sort of, um, you know, kid, kid them all the way along that we're, mm -hmm. that we're doing something. No, my mum was a really popular teacher. It was a lovely thing for me. I was at the school where she taught and people used to say to me, oh, your mum's teaching us. And I, I used to realise that there, there was teachers who were really well respected yeah. and, and liked. But no, I've met lots of my ex-pupils, and even in the short time that I've ta I taught, I taught over in uh, in Mary Hill, and uh, in the short time that I taught, I still meet people that I, I, I work with and taught. It was a very happy place. It did obviously work out quite well for you in the end, though, because you, you did stick to the music. You made something of a success of it. As we can see from this next picture, this is, um, well, a very young-looking Deacon Blue. Yeah, this is, uh, I think this is 1980. Six and this is the you know uh, Doogie uh, who, who and I who put the band together in the first place. We went through different different people came and went. The late Graham Kelling in the middle looked very handsome there. Mm. Uh, Jim Prime and, and Ewan Vernal. Uh, Lorraine was probably somewhere in the wings. We were probably going off. I think from memory we were going off to do a gig somewhere. Uh, Lorraine wasn't officially in the band at the time, um, but this was us in, in '86. We just signed our first record deal, and we hadn't played much outside Glasgow. Uh, and we would probably be on our way in a, in a minibus somewhere to do a gig, you know, somewhere else. You've, there have been various incarnations. You, you, you started off, you tried a few different things. Was this the band you were aiming for? Was this what you were, the, the ultimate dream? You know, when, when, yeah, when, they, when they came together, uh, when, when this band came together, that's how Deacon Blue, you know, really sounded like they do. You know, that, mm -hmm. it was, it was that, that combination of people. And that, that's, that's what all good, you know, when you get any good band together, it's it's a it's a people that, that that make it sound you know unique, and um, that was that was what happened in in that case. A lot of success in a very short space of time once you did get the band together, or is that a myth? You know, it's it's, it's really funny to us. It seemed like a long haul. You know, <laughs> it seemed like you know we put out a single, and everyone now says, oh, you know. Uh, Oh, you know, we used to play Dignity, and I said, like, no, you didn't, no one played it. No one played it. <laughs> Never seemed to us that anyone played it. But we did put out, you know, single after single <clears> on that first record, and it, it didn't really happen at first for us. But then eventually it did happen, and we actually then end up with the, the first single on the second record, which really broke through. And I think that then people had to go and, you know, these days people have to go and buy records, nowadays they don't, but they went off and bought the first album and I think that changed our life really a, a yeah. lot. And, you know, it, 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 it did seem like, a, it probably was 18 months really of, of, you know, constant touring and so on, but relatively speaking, I don't suppose it was that long. 30 years down the line is not that no. long, but it must have seemed an eternity at the time, I can imagine. This um, next picture, just before the break, um, here you are. This is a rather idyllic looking picture. Tell us uh, what's happening here. This is a photograph from uh, somewhere in the background, should say Hollywood, but it was the first <laughs> night in, uh, in, in Los Angeles. We were just probably off a plane. Um, we went over in 1988 to record uh, some tracks for our second album. It did, the recording session didn't work out. I mean, the big regret I have, it was, it was recorded in the studio and that I now realise I should have you know, made more notes or taken more photographs inside the studio. <laughs> uh, Sunset Sound, which is a very, very famous place. But the kind of upside of it was that we kind of um, had a great time in California. We had friends that were, stayed further north, were getting married. San Francisco, still good friends. Um, and we went up to their wedding. We, we discovered the joys of sort of, you know, getting to LA and hiring a car and just, you know, going around the place. And I suppose we discovered something about ourselves, which wasn't that, this wasn't the record that we should be making at that point, <laughs> come home and do it properly. Um, so it didn't exactly work out as you'd hoped in America? No, I mean, we, 
you know, first, we always wanted to go to America and tour, I think. By the time that we got there, and we were with a big record label who, you know, you needed their support to do it. And I think we were quite an expensive band uh, to probably support doing that. So we never really got that opportunity. The following year, we did tour, we did some great gigs, we enjoyed it, but we never felt we got that kind of, you know, support that we needed. So we didn't tour in America as much yeah. as we should have done. You still made it big, though, and we'll find out a whole lot more about that very shortly. It's time for a break. Stay with us for more of Ricky Ross's Life in 10 Pictures. Hello again, welcome back to My Life in 10 Pictures with my guest today, writer and performer, Ricky Ross. Uh, Ricky, let's take a look at your next picture. This, um, I gather, is something of a hero of yours, and we're talking about the chap on the left. Yeah, not the one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> the Troublemaker, middle. that the one. The one in the middle yeah. is a great Billy Sloan, who's, who's been a great friend <laughs> to us over the years. Uh, <clears> but you can see, it's just very funny, when I was a youth worker, my, one of the kids used to come up and we were around measuring smiles. And uh, this, this girl came up and measured, she said, you've got the biggest smile, <laughs> <laughs> the widest mouth thing is what she meant. Uh, and that, I think, is a picture of my biggest smile, simply because mm -hmm. I was meeting Kenny Douglas. You know, I, you know, I grew up a Dundee United supporter, but I grew up in that era where I could see, you know, Kenny Douglas would come up and score a barrel load of goals against us. And, mm -hmm. But I was able to support him when he played for Scotland. <laughs> my uncle took me, did a great thing for me when I was a kid. He was a Celtic supporter and he brought me through to a European night at Parkhead when I was a schoolboy. It was a fantastic experience. Kenny Ruglish and Lou McCarry and all these guys were playing. And I saw him play at Hamden a number of times. Um, and he just had that, he, he still does, he still has that great charisma of, of, of being a star footballer. And I was just so excited to meet him. It was in Liverpool uh, when he was either still the manager of Liverpool or he was just about to go to Blackburn Rovers. Um, and in Liverpool, he walked on water, as you can imagine. Sure. Uh, we were there for a gig uh, celebrating John Lennon Day in 1990, and <clears throat> he was there. And yeah, I was very happy. You know, he looks quite happy as well, I have to be <laughs> said, uh, meeting you or being in the same picture of you, as you. Or maybe it was Billy Sloan, who knows? Uh, this next picture, uh, we're still in the football theme here. Um, you see you, you've been a lifelong Dundee uh, United supporter. Has that been painful at times? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angus. You're piercing a wound there. Uh, yes, it has been painful. I mean, the, 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 the odd thing is I've lived more than half my life away from Dundee, so uh, I, I do support them from a distance. I started taking my son just because I wanted to take him to football. I didn't really want to inflict it on him, uh, but he's, he's taken it up with a vengeance and he yeah. now, and he knows what's coming. <laughs> it's going to be a division down. Mind so, you, you are actually celebrating in this picture, so yeah. that, that this is not Well, this is hugely significant. I mean, it's not just about winning the cup. This is 1994, Dundee United finally won the cup. Uh, the night before, Deacon Blue had played what we thought would be our last ever gig on earth. Uh, mm. um, as a friend of mine who's a, a chaplain at, in the Barras area, and he said to me, I was there when you, you died and went to heaven <laughs> <laughs> at the bar lines. So the night before was Deacon Blue's last show, but the more probably <laughs> significantly for me was the night of the semi-final replay of the Cup. I was to go to Hamden and I got a call. My father was actually in the Royal Victoria Hospital, which is just beside Hamden. I was going to go and see him because he loved listening to football on the radio, but he wasn't very well at that time. I was going to set up his radio so he could listen and then go at the game got a call to see my father had gone downhill very quickly. In fact, had died. So, um, you know, it was very poignant for me. I'd been in a lot of cup finals with my dad. Uh, sometimes it was so exciting. I thought he was, he was going to have another heart attack. You know, it was, it was one of these uh, things. And so going to this final, where we finally won in the most ludicrous kind of way, because we didn't really have a great team, and it was a kind of bizarre goal, which I managed to miss being in the pie queue after <laughs> half time. Oh, so all, of, all the things were wrong, <clears throat> but nevertheless, we won. I knew someone who knew Davy Bowman, obviously, and I said, get Bo over here. Uh, I, I knew Bo a little bit, and, and Davy came over, and I just jumped off <laughs> into the, onto the pitch and hugged him. The next thing we were surrounded by Glasgow's finest, who told us we were the problem. But as I said, I think I said them at the time, look, I've been here so many times, losing no court in the land will, will convict me. They'll, mm. they'll, they'll see the merit in what I'm doing. You can just imagine the headlines <clears> if they had arrested you. So a big year then, obviously. That was a major, major year in your life, that mm. one. Uh, 94 was, I mean, uh, we, I think we were about to move house. My father had, had died, which was a big thing. Uh, we, the band uh, was to 
to, to split up and weren't get, going to get back together. We didn't think we'd get back together at all. As it happened, we did five years later. And then uh, we had a... My youngest daughter was was expected and she came along in the November. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of things happened in that year. Busy diary that year by the sound of it. Um, your daughter, in fact, is in this, uh, this, this next picture. This is one of those... It's a cracking picture, beautiful setting and a great family. What's yeah, happening? Th uh, this is the cobbler, which I'd never been up before, and actually I haven't since. Finally decided to do it. My, my family are now scattered. Uh, well, at, th at that point, they weren't scattered too far, but they were about to be my eldest daughter, who's in the middle of the picture with the Czech uh, jacket on. She's currently, she lives in San Francisco pretty well permanently, so she's not often there. Um, to, uh, to her uh, left uh, is, is, my, is the next one down, who's about to go to Australia for a year. And on this side, the daughter that was born in 94, Georgia, who's about uh, to leave uh, as well for another year studying down in England, so uh, and then she's going on to China. So it it, it just gets difficult getting mm -hmm. everyone together. And then my son, who's actually uh, he's actually really my height now, <laughs> but um, you know, to me the happiest. This would be my me at my happiest. I was my wife's there as well, and just us all together uh, and going up the most beautiful part of Scotland. You know, one of, one of these beautiful days. Scotland. People often complain about the weather, but the great thing is you get a day like that, and you just enjoy what you have. Um, it's a magical, magical place, and you get your family together and you do something like that, and these are the days that you treasure. Yeah, you, I mean, you've reached some pinnacles in your, in your life, but you look quite contented there. I, I think it's, it's actually reasons. really difficult to get everyone mm. together, and so we, work, we worked very hard recently. Caitlin, my oldest girl, came over with her boyfriend, and we just made a big effort to all be right. in, in Fife at the, on the East Newt just together Super. for the weekend. So, yeah, these are, these are the things that <clears throat> make you really happy. To the, to the next picture, then, uh, we, we, we've discussed the musicianship, the performing, the singing, the writing, collaborating, but this is, uh, this is the other string to your bow, the broadcasting thing, which you're getting very heavily into now. Um, significance in this? Well, you can see how happy I am. Yeah. Um, I do a show called Another Country, which has been you know, on the radio now for about eight years. It's a country-based programme. We kind of like make it up as we go along. <laughs> uh, I say we, my producer Richard Murdoch and myself, uh, have just great fun. We both met each other and we asked each other, did, did you know anything about country music? We both said no. <laughs> and we sort of kind of uh, been given the show on that basis and because we kind of are finding out as well. And we, we do love it, we genuinely love it, but we don't know that much about it. So for us, it's an adventure as well. And then the greatest thing for me, probably, although you get to interview really interesting artists and you hear great stories, it's still that thing of, for me, the joy is uh, putting on a record and saying, listen to this, because that's what I did. I used to do all the time in my own bedroom and, what, you know, and my pals said, listen, listen to this. And, and all you wanted when you bought a new record, when, you, when you'd fallen in love with it, was to get some people in your room, listen to this, it's great. So that was kind of, that's all that I've ever wanted to do. So you can see how happy I am. And that's me playing old vinyl as well, which, which makes me, so we still play a lot of vinyl on the radio, yeah. which makes me very happy. It's great to share the experience. And it's, this is, seems to be something you're building on as well, because you're doing more and more broadcasting. We hear you, you know, Celtic connections and stuff. Well, until <clears> they <throat> kind of throw... <laughs> <laughs> till they, till I get fun out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no one's fun done that yet. But yeah, I, I, you know, having a a, a a regular show, and and you know, meeting some amazing people, it's 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 a real joy. So uh, if no one complains, I'm, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll I'll stay. I'll try to keep doing it. <laughs> okay. To our last picture then uh, for today. The time has just kind of flown by. It really has. It's a picture, a very recent picture, in fact, of yeah. of, of, of Deacon Blue. Is this where we're at now? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I think it might be the hydro just across the road. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, we played a couple of years back. I'm not sure. It's certainly the end of a show. It's the end of a tour, and it's the current lineup of Deacon Blue. Uh, Lorraine, obviously, Jim, myself and Doogie, and then Lewis, Gordon and Gregor Philp. And Gregor has been a sh such a huge addition. He obviously came in to play guitar uh, after Graham uh, died. And he's just, you know, all of us have just found a new kind of happy, um, you know, real joy, I would say, in, in playing live, finding out that the audience are still there for the songs, uh, making new music. We've made, you know, three albums about to, well, I'm about to release a third album in, his, in about four years. So that for us has been a very, you know, very creative and being creative makes you happy. And I just think you, even in that photograph, you can just see, 
you know, that's the end of a, a two-hour show. And there's a wee, there's a journey that happens. You go on stage, you know, people not sure what they're going to get sometimes, and then you get to the end, and there's this lovely moment for about two or three minutes at the end where you just feel there's no real gap between you and the audience, mm -hmm. and you're all in that room together, and you all matter. And that's that point, and that's what makes me. That's what makes performance really like great the for me. like the radio experience, the metaphorically touching your audience. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Where do we go from here? What what what's next? Well, we'll do more of this. I mean, this is you know we, we've sort of you know one propels the other. We we go off on tour and we we kind of think that was really good. Let's go to the studio, you know, and mm -hmm. bring some of that creativity there. So we the new album uh, Believers comes out this September, and we go off on tour in November. And we don't really think much beyond that. You know, we, I'd like to think we get to the end of that and go, that was great, will we, will we do it again? But we're all getting to an age where you never know what's around the corner. So I think we're just enjoying every kind of moment and stopping. You know, there's a, there's a moment in every show now I do, I just take time just to look up and think, this is OK, you know, this is great. <laughs> Well, that'll do nicely. That's a nice position to be in. Ricky, thanks indeed for coming Thank you, in. Angus. Thank you Today, so much. join us again very soon as we look at another life in 10 pictures.